you know what, UG99, you've heard of that, okay? okay? They have found a gene, maybe others too, but they have found a gene in corn that resists. If UG99 at this point in time ever jumped, that's Uruguay, they found it in 1999, it's stem rust. Stem rust is what plagues us immensely. If that, if that race of rust ever got here, all the spring wheat in the northern places we know it would be wiped out, just like in the 30s and 40s when you read about the red clouds of dust and stuff like that. And by the way, we know stem rust has been the worst disease ever to plague wheat on the face of the planet. Biblical everything when they talk about it, it's, it's stem rust. Where did we get resistance from stem rust? Does anybody know? For our wheats, because we don't think about it. We're, we're all young here, so we don't remember stem rust. It came out of emmer. To find that resistance, the disease that plagued us came out of this. So these, whether these crops are useful, as Elizabeth talked about, or whether they're useful to, 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 to help in plant breeding for, for new races of rust and stuff, they are very valuable. Quickly, what we've been evaluating these for a number of years, what do we get for yields? We don't have the database with einkorn like we have emmer, but einkorn, and, and I, basically everything we've been doing has been organic, so we don't have a conventional comparison. But iron corn, I would feel pretty confident to say I'm probably in the plot been running maybe in that 15 to 1600 pound range. Emmer's slightly higher if I look at the long term. We, we might be doing 1800 pounds or so. And I think some of these yields, when I have had studies in farmers' fields or in farmers that have had, had the emmer in the same year, we, we were very comparable. I know the one year when I had emmer in, in Lewis's farm, his field went about 2,000 pounds. The plots went about 2,000 pounds. Matt Loken, another farmer that was growing that same that same thing happened. And I think Blaine's yields are pretty much similar. So we're seeing the same thing. What I like about some of these crops, particular emmer, is as Elizabeth said, they're tough. Weed competition, everything. You know, they um, not to make a, you know poor analogies, but they seem more adapted to in an environment that isn't spoon-fed a lot of nitrogen and, and, and stuff like that. So in other words, they seem very adapted to the organic environment. So these are what, you know, everybody calls them everything these days, and I don't know what to do with it, so I'm sticking with ancient grains. I'm sticking with, when, I, when we say ancient grains, it's emmer, einkorn, spelt, because they're the oldest. When we talk heritage wheats, I'm going to go with um, wheats that are, you know, varieties that are slightly older most common definition some people like to stick with is pre-1950 varieties. What happened in 1950? We drastically changed our agricultural program and our breeding programs. We were breeding varieties in the environment of intended use, meaning high nitrogen fertilizers, using herbicides, you know, so uh, the classification then, so some people, maybe anecdotal and stuff, they have a belief that some of these older varieties may be more adapted to these organic environments because that's they were bred in that intention, and they may have a better nutritional quality. That's up for dispute at this point in time, but we also know there's sure a lot of press and controversy right now on wheat. Whatever that is, I don't know. I'm an agronomist or I'm a farmer agronomist or whatever, but I think there's a lot of nutritional things to be asked uh, on that. Um, and I think that may be leading to some of the popularity. We do have one emmer, uh, or one in the emmer trial. We have we did put kamut. Has anybody ever heard of kamut? It's slightly different than emmer. That's Bob Quinn out there in Montana. We actually need to model him. He did a lot of nutritional work, and he took this crop that no one was grazing, raising, and and did phenomenal work with it. And he was speaking out at a conference this winter, and actually, um, he's selling a lot of it into Europe, and it has to do with. Uh, some of the you know the energy and, 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 and like the runners and stuff like that they like it much better than other pasta. So a lot of these crops can be used for you know many different things from breads to pastas. Maybe the last thing I'll just touch on so you help you understand it. Einkorn is the oldest as Elizabeth said. It's up for you know the most numbers I used 12,000 years ago it shows up about the same time man first started farming. Emmer is about 10, spelt is about 5, and free thrashing wheat as we know it, maybe about three. So if you think about that, that's kind of chronologically how they came about. Also, genetically, um, this is a very simple set of chromosomes. It's a diploid. Then emmer is the next one where it's a, it's a, it's a hexaploid. It has more uh, complex number of chromosomes. Emmer, derm, kamut are all same genetically. And then when you get to spelt, it's a tetraploid, which is the same as spring wheat. It has like 42 sets of chromosomes. Thanks. That's why you got to have plant breeders. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I'd get it wrong. I knew I'd do it wrong. Anyway, but
that's just kind of, you know, for a layman's genetics there. There we go. Thank you, Frank. Um, but with that, you know, I just want to close, and, and we'll just leave it at that. But it does seem like the interest is picking up. I'm glad to see some of the farmers here. You know, when they didn't sell seed when you're promoting it, it was a little goosey when they were filling up their bins coming to their farms. You know, they weren't real happy. So I'm glad to see they're starting to sell their hammer and they're talking to me again. And with that, that's just a joke. But with that, let's take any questions, and we'll just move on down the line. Yes. Stand establishment in difficult conditions. I fear when I had them all in the same planting date, the same thing, I was surprised how much faster. I was thinking, you know, because sometimes when we do germinations in the lab, you know, the emmer is slightly slower, but emmer pops so fast this year. Now, einkorn I like, but it, you know, it looks really, really good now, but it's not as competitive. And you can see differences, and this is why in organics, just to use the point, why competitiveness is so important. When you look at a variety that's you know, a little more competitive and, and heads out faster as early, you can see the difference in weeds, you know. And everything that, again, I think probably most farmers do, although not all do, because I, uh, you know, some will dehull it. We do not, I don't dehull anything. I don't believe you dehull anything. And I think that seed, that uh, hull around that seed, I think it's nature's fungicide, seed protector. I think it's seed tree. It, I think it protects that seed. I, I totally believe it protects it in storage. I think, because we can hear that some of this can store quite long. And sometimes if they dehull it, it does not store as long. So I, I, that's nature's protection mechanism. You know, I mean, I store seed some, some long periods of time as a seed saver and stuff like that also, and probably don't have the best storage facilities. But you know what? <laughs> you never get any insects in your emmer. I don't know why. But you'll get it in your wheat, but you never seem to see insect damage, you know, the stored grain insects in your hammer. And why? I do not know. What do you got, white heads here? Is that a fly or something? Uh, that's probably a good observation. What you do is probably wheat stem maggot. If you pull it, it's a wheat stem maggot. pulls out. So there's a little maggot down there. You always see those heads in spring wheat. Never very much, but that's generally what it is. If you ever see that, you pull it out, it's a little maggot down there. Chew you out. Hey, any other further questions? What do you do for tillage spring and fall? Okay, this was, I really kind of messed up maybe last year. This is my cover crop and it kind of got away on me. It was sedan grass, I got eight feet tall. So I had a mess with with the little, I had a six foot John Deere disc. You know, that's not really kind of a wishy disc there, you boys and girls. Um, so I had to get a lot of residue to get rid of. And I thought I was going to have a disaster. That's why this was a little later, but I was amazed. Just did in the spring again, went through with the international cultivator. So I use I use an international virus shank cultivator as my heaviest tillage. Because most of the equipment, I, I keep it to scale. It's all small six foot equipment, so I don't have any stuff. So I do use a, wish, uh, a John Deere um, offset disc to, to, you know, to incorporate my residues, my straw and stuff like that. And a, an international cultivator and a Danish s tine cultivator right prior to planting. So I'll finish it off with a light tillage right before I plant. I'm trying to do minimum tillage. Still more than I like, but it's a necessary evil. So how many times did you disc it? Last fall I had to disc it a couple times and then once this spring. <laughs> but what I was really worried about is the harrow because there was so much there I thought I was never going to be able to harrow, but I actually harrowed it and it didn't do too bad. The residue broke down pretty good? Yeah, it broke down. That's one thing you learn when you, when you want to run this Einbach harrow. You want all this residue, but you know, after you see, guess what that hero does when you start running it through the blade? No, it's, he's a farmer. Well, I had to learn that one on my own. <laughs>